Well, thank you all. Uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're running a little bit behind, but uh, we're going to try to get ourselves on schedule. And um, so for, uh, for, this, um, for this panel, uh, we, are, we are lucky to have some, uh, some local folks who are going to uh, talk to us about the actual impact of the sharing and gig economy on the Bloomington community and hopefully uh, give some insight into local communities more generally. And to moderate this panel, we have one of our uh, current 2L associates, Audrey Brittingham. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, panelists, for being here. Um, so first, I'm going to do a brief introduction of the panelists. Um, all the way uh, down on your left-hand side, first we have Daniel Bingham. Daniel's a Bloomington native. He's a software engineer and climate justice activist and community organizer. He works as the DevOps lead at Seros, uh, a high-growth software startup based out of New York. He runs the team that manages their deployment pipeline and their cloud infrastructure at Amazon Web Services. He recently ran for City Council for Bloomington um, on a platform to change infrastructure and public transportation to be environmental and to counteract climate change. Uh, next, we have Mike McAfee. Mike is the executive director of Visit Bloomington, which promotes Monroe County to potential travelers uh, to increase visitation and economic growth in our area. Mike has experience in, many, uh, in marketing in many areas, like national radio. Uh, he worked for Six Flags for a bit, uh, and city and statewide tourism. Recently, he's been an adjunct marketing professor here at IU Bloomington. Uh, next, we have Beth Rosenbarger. Beth is on the planning services is the planning services manager for the City of Bloomington Planning and Transportation Department. Uh, as the long range planning lead for the city, Beth likes to call herself the city's uh, life coach, always working to remind the community and elected officials of our adopted goals and how we can and should align our decisions, policies, budget, and actions with our goals in order to become the community that we do aspire to be, uh, instead of making the decisions based on what is true now, like perpetuating the status quo. Beth has a master's degree in community and regional planning, is the member of the American Institute for Cert Certified Planners, and has worked locally as a professional planner for the past seven years. Uh, finally, we have Nick Browning. Nick teaches at the Media School at IU Bloomington. He teaches several classes on public relations and strategic communication. His research focuses on uh, organization public relations, particularly the actions and ethics of both businesses and political organizations, and how these actions and ethics uh, affect each other and the public. Uh, so one reason that the sharing economy uh, is put into quotations is because that there is general disagreement about what the sharing economy is, is not, and should be. Just so to situate us locally, our panelists will open up by discussing how they view the sharing economy based on their work and experiences. So Daniel, do you want to go ahead and start us off there? Uh, sure. Um, so, oh boy. Um, I would actually challenge the title of sharing economy entirely. Um, when people are talk, when people say sharing economy, they're talking about you know Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, Etsy, TaskRabbit, these sorts of companies. And there's no, if you look at each of those companies, there is no sharing going on anywhere. Airbnb is an online marketplace for rentals, for housing rentals, short term, long term. It, it's a rental marketplace. Uber and Lyft are also online marketplace platforms where people are selling rides. They're not sharing anything. It's they're selling. Um, you know, Etsy. It's a, again an online marketplace. TaskRabbit's an online marketplace for people to sell their services. These are markets that are being created. There's no sharing happening. Um, I challenge that because because language really matters. Uh, how we talk about things impacts how we think about them, which impacts things like how we regulate them. So if we're thinking about the sharing economy as sharing, then we're going to regulate it differently than if we're treating it as what they are, which is markets, private markets that are run, that they are then charging access to these markets. Um, there are a lot of things that exist that we don't talk about very much that could be considered sharing economies. Um, one of them, I never know what to, what to put in my bio for these sorts of things because I've done a lot of different stuff. So I served as the uh, board president of Bloomington Cooperative Living for three years. Bloomington Cooperative Living is a housing cooperative. It is 
it's a nonprofit. It is governed by its members. It provides housing in three separate housing to 45 different people. They control it. The, ho the housing, the people who live there control it. They share kitchen space. They share living space. Um, they do pay rent, but they get to set their own rent because it's a nonprofit and they are in control of it. That, that is one thing that could be defined as a sharing economy. There are housing cooperatives like that all over the country uh, in many cities. Some of them get very big. There's one in, um, I'm blanking, I think it's Madison, Wisconsin, that has 12 houses and, you know, houses two to 300 people. Um, and they come in many shapes and sizes. Um, another form of sharing economy are things like, uh, locally, we have the Glenn Carter Memorial Tool Share, where it's, it's a tool library. Um, an artist uh, who was very active in the activist community passed away and left his tools to the activist community to start this tool library. He had a huge collection, and they are working on um, creating basically a free lending service where if you need, say, a pair of needle-nose pliers or you need a drill or a saw, you can come check it out from the library, use it, and then turn it back. So instead of each of us having to keep a massive tool set of tools we use twice a year, you just have access to that tool when you need it. All, all for free, run by activists. That's a form of sharing economy. Um, one we do talk about somewhat, but not as much as we should, is open source software. Um, all of these companies that are you know, charging these fees, all of the billion dollar software companies, almost every single one of them depends on open source software to do what they do. Most of these giant billion dollar companies run their servers on Linux. Linux was developed for free by people in their spare time in a rather anarchistic way, honestly, um, to be a free operating system for anybody to use. Most servers run Ubuntu, AWS offers Amazon Linux, which is built on top of Linux and is mostly used for EC2 servers. This, it's a full operating system. It's hugely effective. Trying to run it on, run software or anything else is a huge pain in the ass, honestly. It's, it's vast amounts of value that is just freely available and shared for anyone to use. That's part of why it's relatively actually easy for engineers, software engineers, to start new startups because the tooling is all there and it's all shared and it's all free and that value isn't accounted for. Interesting to note in that is that these startups, because of the way they're all structured, because of the capital shape of our economy, they are vacuuming money out of the economy and sending it straight into the pockets of investors, and they're do they couldn't do it without these freely shared tools that were built by people in their spare time for free and given freely. I would say that's the true sharing economy, and I would say we shouldn't let these gig companies get away with calling themselves the sharing economy. Thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> well, that's not what I'm going to talk about at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me again. My name is Mike McAfee, and um, I'm, I'm really going to stick to uh, what, I, what I sort of know, um, how the sharing economy impacts tourism in the visitor industry, um, particularly here in Bloomington, and, and uh, the huge impact that it's having on college towns all across all across the country, the huge impact that it's having, having on the world. I, I just want to, I want to share some stats with you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about social media as well, but I'll share some stats with you about um, short-term rentals in the Bloomington area. Um, this was as of January 1. Um, Airbnb gave me this information. There were 660 active Airbnb listings in Bloomington. So it doesn't mean there are 660 online right now. It means... 660 hosts have, or, or, or it, it could be people with multiple listings, obviously, but, but there are 660 units out there that um, play in, in Airbnb at some point. They, they could be on the market for a week, off the market for a week, that type of stuff. So 660 as of January 1. Um, in um, 2019, uh, Bloomington hosts welcomed 34,330. 300 Airbnb guests to Bloomington. Um, 51,700 Bloomington residents used Airbnb for travel. The top six origin states for Airbnb guests to Bloomington are in order Indiana, um, which is responsible for 42% of the Bloomington guests. Illinois, Ohio, California, Kentucky, and Michigan are the other five. Um, Bloomington Airbnb hosts made uh, $4 million in supplemental income from sharing their home in 2019. Um, 
The top five weekends, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into those. The top five weekends for Airbnb guests who arrive in Bloomington and they, and they list them out. But every one of those weekends is a huge IU event, as you can imagine. Graduation is on there. And really the other four were home football games and guests arriving were anywhere from 1,100, from 1,000 people to 1,400 people that weekend. And a graduation weekend alone, um, total host earnings were $300,000. Um, you know, the thing that's really changing with, with Airbnb and, and that they're starting to do is, is they're um, uh, really, really engaging with, with guests and, and offering experiences. Um, you know, 92% of Airbnb, Airbnb hosts say they recommend restaurants and cafes to guests. 56% say they recommend cultural activities such as museums, festivals, and historic sites. 55% um, um, say ho hosts say that hosting them has helped them afford their homes. Um, I know several people in Bloomington that are buying second homes to put on the Airbnb market, and, and they call that their retirement. That is, that is going to be my retirement in 20 years when, when I retire from my other job. Um, on average, Airbnb guests say 41% of their spending occurs in the neighborhoods where they stay. So, uh, um, you know, it, work, it works really well here in a college town, as you can imagine. Um, lots of rental units and, and those types of things that can be easily turned over into that. Well, that's what we find in, in all the statistics coming back from um, Airbnb and, and VRBO and, and home, home Away. Um, you know, Asheville, North Carolina is exploding. You know, we, we, we've got a huge business going here with it, um, mostly college towns. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, the big thing for, for, for us at Visit Bloomington is, is really up until this past July, um, I kind of called it the Wild West show. Um, there was absolutely no regulation and no way to know um, who was doing what and where they were and how it was going. Um, um, luckily, and, 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 and make no bones about it, financially, um, it was a big benefit for Visit Bloomington when this past July 1, um, legislation went into effect where short-term rentals had to start collecting all local taxes. So before that, they didn't have to collect sales tax. They didn't have to collect innkeeper's tax. My, my, my office is funded by a 5% lodging tax. So anytime somebody comes here and for, for graduation weekend, when, room, when it's three-night minimum at $600 a night, um, there's a 5% tax collected on that. Or, or tonight when rates are $89 out at the Holiday Inn Express, 5% tax collected by the county. And um, we, we, we receive a portion of that to, to do our marketing and sales with. Um, so up until this past July, um, there, none of that was collected. And not, not even the 7% sales tax, what, what, you know, they were supposed to be collecting it, but many of them weren't. But this legislation went into effect where um, the best thing about it is that the, the, the homeowner or the, the, the rental owner doesn't have to do anything. It is automatically done on the platform. Um, calculated and collected, they pull it out, send it to the county, or I mean, send it to the state, and, and it's dealt with in that way. So it's great that you know the, the 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 homeowner that might be renting out their extra bedroom, or or the super host that might own three houses or whatever, they don't have to touch it. It's automatically done for them. But um, I can tell you this: in in 2019, um, uh, hotel revenue for rooms in Bloomington was 59 million dollars. And um, in 2018, it was $62 million. So it decreased by $3 million. But that tax that funds our office increased by 6%. So where's that difference coming from? It's coming from those short-term rentals, all those Airbnb rentals. It's, it is without a doubt. That's where it's happening. Um, you know, ben, it's, there's a lot of benefits to it. Uh, competition is good. Um, I just talked about those crazy rates over graduation weekend. Well, average daily rate was down $3.00 per room in the market last year. Again, that's all because of Airbnb rentals coming in, competing, driving, driving rates down. It's, it's forcing our uh, hotels and, and lodging community to, to rethink uh, how they do business. Um, um, price, you know, those, those, those huge pricey, price gouging, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's, it's really um, curbing that and eliminating that a lot. Um, so fair rates, um, obviously more product um, there are times, as you know, um, when, when you can't find a hotel room in this community. Um, Beth and I were talking, you know, we, it's, 
you don't build a church just for Easter Sunday is a, is a saying we like to say a lot. Um, obviously, there are, there are weekends and, and nights in this community where we need 10,000 more rooms, but then there are, there are nights like tonight where we'll be 50% full. So um, it's a balance of all that. That's what really what Visit Bloomington tries to do is create business during those, those slower times. But uh, so, yeah, competition is good, um, fair rates, more product out there. The challenges, um, as you can imagine, when there are 660 units out there being rented, that means probably there are 660 units that are not out there for single families to live in. Those are 660 units not on the market. Um, you better believe that a good host, if they're working it, they can make easily three times the amount of money um, renting on Airbnb than they can doing long-term rentals of their of their of their place without a doubt um, if you just watch the calendar for your market and Airbnb even helps you do that they're getting more and more sophisticated in 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 coaching uh, owners on how to price their rental units and, and all types of stuff like that because they're keyed into the markets um, you know the biggest the biggest issue I we, we, we do the best we can to to work with with all the owners and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second um, but but um, the marketplace and, and competition kind of works things out and, and they figure it out and, and, and it'll it'll straighten things out but the big thing for us was and and again um, how we welcomed what happened in July with with them doing some regulation of it was safety and quality um, it's a big deal to us. Obviously, if a if a college student is is renting out their couch for fifty bucks a night during graduation weekend, and there's no lock on the back door or on the on the kitchen window, that's a huge safety concern for us. When we're out there, you know, one of the ways we promote Bloomington um, is is that we're safe, walkable community for visitors. I mean, we truly are. Um, we, we sure we have things happen over the years, but but every every town does. So safety and quality were big for us. How do we how can we promote something when, when we don't even know where they're at and we, we don't know, you know, if, if again, if, if they have locks on the doors and things like that. So that has helped a lot. Neighborhoods, um, we, were, we were hearing um, lots of complaints from neighbors who every weekend there are 10, there are 10 cars parked next door to us and, and they're having parties. They're turning them into party houses. Um, so that's not good. And, and then consistency. Uh, you know, if we start working with a with an Airbnb owner that's renting out their house, and like I said, if 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 they only have it open on on big weekends and they don't have it open during the week and and other nights when we're trying to drive more business to the community, we you know we don't need to drive business to the community during football weekends. So we want to we want to try to create those experiences and do those things on Monday nights, Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights. So so if places aren't open, it's hard for us to work with them and and. Um, um, consistently market them so it's kind of a feast and famine thing um, when when the when the town is really busy there's a lot of them out there and they're making a lot of money but when but when it's slower times like like February is a slow time they're not on the market and, and that's a famine time for them I'm happy to answer I'll probably talk more about that in a second answer some questions I um, you know that it's we're, we're just a a small like like so many ways Bloomington is such a good snapshot of what's happening in our country and in the world but you know places like Amsterdam and, and Venice uh, they they are really suffering from it um, you know their 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 owners are are seeing just as I talked about before how how much more profitable it is and easier it is on on them to rent those out on those short term platforms versus renting them out long term to to tenants who don't take care of it and, and that type of stuff so so having a lot of problems with that overseas especially I'm not going to talk much about transportation I know Beth is going to talk quite a bit about probably more about that you know obviously uber Lyft and shuttles and and bicycles and and scooters have a big impact on on the tourism industry again um, you know we don't we don't hear too many issues with that unless Unless there's a problem, you know, unless you know somebody had a, a safety incident, and and luckily we don't have much of that in Bloomington. But maybe I'll key off of some things Beth says in a second. But social media-wise, which to me, which to me is you, know, um, uh, I'm no I'm no expert on on the sharing economy, but that's that's what I, I I don't that's what I think of first when I when I think of the sharing economy, and and that really changed us visit Bloomington and how we market. Uh, uh, 
Facebook and, and, and all those platforms are the most efficient marketing tools we have by, by far. Uh, you know, we, we, we rarely do any print media anymore. Um, um, we're, we're very rarely printing guides and things like that. Everything we're trying to do is, is all about the authenticity of, of Facebook and Instagram and, and, and those social platforms where we want um, user-generated content. I, I mean, we're buying, we've, we've recently bought modules that we want people to, to send us their photos. And those are the photos and things that we're using to market with, again, because they're, they're genuine. Um, they're, they're the influencers. We, we pay big money. Um, a few times a year to bring in influencers that have big followers on on Instagram and things like that. So we want them to come in, and maybe they're going to come in for um, like this this past weekend. We had we had um, a writer here from Midwest Living Magazine doing a doing a story at, at the Bloomington Music Expo on Bloomington's music scene. And again, she's an influencer, has a huge thousands and thousands of followers on Instagram. That's a big deal for us to have her here doing that. So that's why we love the, the social media part of that. And engagement. We used to track everything on uh, how many hits to our website, you know, who clicked through to this, who signed up to receive our e-newsletter. But now it's about you know, who's sharing stuff, who's liking stuff, who's making a comment on our social platforms. And, and we're getting to the point where we're able to uh, measure that. Um, the value of engagement, turning how you know what what turns into actually people end up visiting and having those types of statistics and things like that. So, um, so there's for us there's um, it's a balance. There, there's good and bad things about about the sharing economy. Um, I, I do agree with what Daniel said. I'm not sure about the word sharing. Sometimes it is absolutely a marketing platform for us. Uh, we we look at it that way. Um, uh, and and the short term rentals, I think again over time is is going to level out. But right now, it continues to be such a huge, huge explosion. I, I know um, Airbnb has grown 45% um, globally since it started. It's it's like 10% a year. It, it tends to grow. So I'm all over the place. I'm happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Okay. Thank you, Mike. And Mike's done a good job segueing into our first major discussion about Airbnb. So Beth and Nick, if you guys want to you know, situate yourself in the sharing economy and, um, and then move right into Airbnb um, and what that's looked like for the, for the city. Um, and then Daniel, we'll come back to you on that too. Thanks. So you wanna? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, thanks. So my focus is actually, transportation is kind of what I prepared, that's but <laughs> um, I work within transportation and housing a lot and you actually shouldn't talk about one without talking about the other and uh, the same is true of energy although I'm not going to touch on that tonight or today um, so when we talk about regulation and how we want to or should or whatever regulate different um, platforms within the sharing economy my first question is always what are our goals as a community and how does this new platform or option support or oppose our community goals so we have a thing called a comprehensive plan and it has our goals in it so we don't have to make that up every time there's something new we can refer back to this community adopted plan that has a vision and has adopted goals i brought the goals in case you have any questions about them i love to refer to them this to me when i said i'm like the city's life coach is kind of like how we all set new year's resolutions and this is like managing those New Year's resolutions for 85,000 people. We have a hard time following through on those. So I want us to come back to like, what are our goals? And so shiny new things are distracting. And that doesn't mean they are good or bad, but it means if we can start by looking at our goals, we're more likely to see if it does fit in with what we want to do as a community or not and then regulate from that point. But if we just think scooter share is cool, bike share is neat, Uber and Lyft, oh my gosh, people can use it to go anywhere. Like that, you can't start there. Um, so we should start with our goals. So my second take is that after we've done that, we tailor regulations the best we can to promote options that support our community adopted goals and do the opposite for options or platforms that do not further or worse, directly contradict community adopted goals. So some things are, pretend, let's pretend they're neutral on a goal, sure. 
some things are going to contradict or pull us away from moving toward achieving our goals. And we need to be aware of that and we need to identify the ways that is happening. We probably can't predict all of them, but we should do our best to try and see that and continue to see it as we're regulating something and check back in on that. So in terms of trans transportation, I would say all forms of sharing transportation are not sharing. Um, they're not equally equitable. <laughs> and are not universally promoting city goals. So there are lots of distinctions. I would talk brief, I'm gonna talk briefly about each of those platforms a little bit. So bike share is company owned and operated usually. So there are two big differences between docked systems where bikes have to be returned from where you got them and dockless systems. Uh, there have been big rises and falls with those. Actually docked systems have had a lot more stability and stuck around cities longer than dockless systems. Um, and the cities had sponsors or subsidized bike shares. So there was not an expectation that bike share companies would make the money back themselves. They, uh, cities like New York were like, this fits in with our city adopted goals and we want this in our city, so we are going to find ways to make this work. That's very different than most of the dockless bike shares which were trying to make it all on their own and did not get subsidized. Scooter share, those are company owned electric scooters. They, I am not aware of a docked model of that. They are all dockless, park anywhere, park anywhere at your scooter. Um, cities regulate some and get paid by the scooter companies. So they are not subsidized as far as I know by any city right now and just the opposite, cities are getting money from scooter companies. Scooters, I would say do fit with goals, but I think um, our regulations need to be tailored differently in order for that to be true. And we'll c circle back to some of those. But the life cycle carbon emissions are a challenge still with scooters, but that is most likely resolvable. Um, if they can have longer lasting scooters that are more durable and if scooters are used for longer trips. So if it's replacing a car trip, it is better. If it's replacing a walking trip, it is not fitting in with our goals. Um, another challenge where it's not fitting, I would say, is dedicated parking areas. And that is a challenge because we are not interested in providing dedicated parking areas because we dedicate so much parking area to cars. We'll come back to that. Uh, and I would say the minimum time included in a scooter ride, so all bike shares, uh, all of them that I know of include a minimum amount of time from the time you check out a bike, so you are not racing against a clock. So it's like you have 30 minutes with your bike or 15 minutes. Scooters don't do that. I would think we could do it with a regulation, but we haven't chosen to. So if every scooter ride included a minimum of 10 minutes, people's behaviors would change because you're not racing against a clock and it's not a shorter trip that is worth replacing. So if it includes 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you that is a half mile to a mile instead of a quarter mile or a tenth of a mile. And when we change that, we're changing what people are replacing and how they're using the scooter. Car share. I would say car share does support reduced car ownership. It supports less space dedicated, dedicated to storing private vehicles. I am not totally sure how much it reduces driving, but I'm willing to wager that it likely does somewhat because of the extra steps involved in going to get a shared vehicle. So if people can be a one car household instead of a two car household because they have access to car share, or they can be a zero car household because they are accessing car share. And in all honesty, because there are extra steps to get to the car share, both literally and uh, technology wise, that will change how often you use a car. And so that does align with city goals. Car shares are often subsidized at first in cities because they fit with goals. And then in the case of Ann Arbor, they subsidize it for one year and then the memberships paid for it. Uber and Lyft, um, I am unsure how these platforms support city goals. It is not a share, it is ride hailing. It's the same as a taxi. Um, Uber and Lyft usually drive, they increase vehicle miles traveled because they are not picking up somebody where they drop someone off. They already have the next ride most of the time and it is not adjacent to where they're dropping someone off. Whereas historically a taxi drops someone off, if somebody is there, they're like, great, and that is their preference. Um, and Uber Lyft is always moving. So they have more miles traveled with one or zero passengers than they do, you know, comparatively to a, an old school taxi. Um, 
I would say it has reduced transit ridership. So that is a thing that Uber and Lyft are actively replacing. Um, it does, you know, transit doesn't get a lot of money from fares, but it does matter to argue how many people ride and use our transit, and the fares do matter as well. And it also uh, makes, if there are more, 10th Street is my favorite example that we could always talk about, but if there are 10 people taking an Uber or Lyft to Kelly on 10th Street, then they are also in front of the bus and making people on the bus wait longer. And so they are offsetting the convenience of the bus and taking funding away from it. So when we talk about people getting places, we want them to take the bus. And so we need to think about how this is impacting that. And another regulation impact, I would say, is a lot of people bring up Walmart. I went to a session on this where Walmart is outside of city limits, and so it is unjust that you can't take transit to Walmart. And someone suggested the city partner with Uber and Lyft and pay for rides for people to get there. I think there's a difference between maybe a stopgap option and where we should be in the future, but some challenges with that, I would say, are – Walmart 100% was aware that it located outside of city limits. It is a major corporation, and it did that to pay lower taxes. So they made that choice and are getting a deal by not being in city limits. Number two, we pay. F there's a boundary where we all pay for transit. Walmart is outside of that boundary. We could talk about putting it inside the boundary. I don't know. Figure We can think about that. But when we say we're going to then pay for Uber and Lyft instead – we are paying for independent contractors who are not guaranteed any wage, who don't get health care, don't get sick days or anything like that. So instead of putting our money into a system that I think is a really good job for people, we are saying you aren't getting this money and we're putting it into something else instead. Uh, and then is this inducing sprawl? Probably. I don't know. We need to see more data, but most likely. Um, and there's a new thing called Flex Park, which I would also argue it's not – it is like making your private parking space available to other people, but it does continue to in make parking more valuable by monetizing space that isn't actively being used and competing against other spaces that are already um, provided, thereby making – parking areas more valuable that actually the market would otherwise encourage to turn over to another use. Um, it's, but parking is the most fun one that we could get into. Just kidding. So um, I'm, I know I'm taking more time. I'm going to try to hurry. So I would say I would divide all of those into two categories of status quo that these platforms fit into the status quo and benefit from it, or they are challenging the status quo. And that is why they have a harder time working and serving people as well. So the status quo one would be Uber Lyft. It benefits because we have so much auto automobile infrastructure everywhere. Any place a car can go, Uber Lyft can go. Any place you're comfortable driving, Uber and Lyft can go drive. It works really well for them because that's what we've built out. The things that are pushing back on the status quo are bike share, scooter share, car share, somewhat. More of a cultural pushback. So I think the thing is those actually promote city goals more, but uh, it's harder to get people to do them. Scooter is debatable, but because we don't have the infrastructure to do it. So if you're scared biking, I don't know why there's a difference between if you own the bike or it is part of a bike share, it's still scary to bike. So just saying that now we provide bikes doesn't change that it's easier to bike. It's still the same amount of scary. Um, and then to a certain extent... Oh, I would say I think that bike share and scooter share are also considered more disruptive, especially the dockless models. And I would argue that is because these modes don't fit with automobile-dominated cities, streets, or our culture. So we're very not used to scooters. But if scooters were cars that you could park in a car parking space, people would be fine with it. And we would be like, that's standard. We're so used to it. But they are things we want to be moving toward, but they don't fit in with our infrastructure as is. So to a certain extent, I would say all of these are new shiny things, and they are distracting from the goals we want to be reaching, and it's because it's easier to get bike share or scooter share than it is to change our streets. So it is easier to launch bike share than it is to add a protected bike lane. It is easier to allow scooters than it is to talk about the highway system that runs through our downtown that I would call College and Walnut. And it is easier to complain about scooter parking than it is to get on-street car parking spaces dedicated to store scooters. And so I think that they're important platforms, but when we say, how do these fit in, we have to remember, like, what are all the other things we could be doing instead of only focusing on those as well? 
And so I prefer to zoom out and look at our system, and for transportation, that means the built environment, and that is streets, sidewalks, parking, housing, land use, and see what system we've built, and then the choices people make. And when we pretend it's like a neutral thing, that's silly, of course, too, because people are making choices based on the system we've built. So we have our design and our behavior and our values, and that's just like if I made a little circle with arrows, they just keep going into each other. Um, and finally, I'd like to talk about, I don't know how many people have read the book, Nudge, that's like you can uh, influence things just by design. And I think sometimes we think of these platforms as like, oh, we can nudge people to do this with social media, we can nudge with that. But I would say in a lot of cases with transportation, it is a nudge competing with a shove. And so the shove is going to win. Uh, so I want us to think about how we're shoving people before we say, but we're nudging this way. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> um, Nick, could you start adding to the, both the lodging and the transportation um, and particularly maybe discuss outreach and messaging of these companies? Yeah, so that, that's my main interest is, is basically how, these, how, how organizations communicate um, with different constituencies, be they government or customers or, or whatever. So I, within that, I would just say that my perspective on this is I don't trust anybody uh, and I don't believe in altruism when it comes to corporations. They, their main goal is their success. And so what that, in, in, and in striving for that, that creates externalities, some positive and some negative. And I don't get the sense that they're particularly caring about that in, unless that negative externality becomes something we as a collective complain about and they have to adjust to. Uh, so what I think is interesting about some of the messaging that goes on is the scooter one is in particular, um, it, in, frankly, infuriating to me <laughs> because um, if you look at, at some of the, the arguments that they make, and the main argument that the you know, bird or lime makes is that it's an environmentally, it's, a, it's an environmental net gain. And it doesn't seem to be when you look at the way in which they're used around Bloomington in particular. So a lot of what you deal with in transportation is first mile, last mile problems. And so their argument is that, well, you can, one, this could subsidize a longer car ride, which it might in May, but not now, if you've been outside. And then the other is, well, they can help you get to a bus station and then go somewhere from you know, using, subsidizing that public transit. Um, but corner to corner in downtown Bloomington is not a mile. So why are there so many scooters in downtown Bloomington? They're not replacing transit rides, they're replacing walking which is a, a, a negative impact on the environment. There's other, other concerns that, that create environmental issues as well, and that's what you were talking about, the life cycle of the scooter, and also um, IU in particular, I don't know how many of those things that the universities rounded up. It's an insane, it's hundreds. Mm -hmm. And basically said, you want them back, you can pay for them, and a lot of the companies have just said, yeah, we can put new ones out there for less than we can pay you, that's fine. So what happens to all these things? We have to find the storage space for it as a university. If we toss them out, that's garbage. That's not good for the environment either. So you see these disconnects between what the messaging itself is and then what actually happens with the product that becomes somewhat, um, to me, off-putting. And, and when you think it, other negative externalities with, with Airbnb, and I, I agree with Mike's point about it, it, it creates a lot of flexibility about when these busy weekends are and when they aren't. But the other danger is that when you said people, oh, this is my retirement, and they, they buy a home and they rent it out, well, that's a home that's not on a market that someone can buy in a place where affordable housing is already a problem, um, even for people that do well in Bloomington. So those are our negative externalities of that that we sort of, we sort of share in that collective cost. Um, and then whenever we attempt to regulate some of these industries, that's something that we share in the cost of as well. So, if you want to have safety issues with Airbnb, or if you look at situations about where scooters are parked, which park is a, a loose word with that, they get strewn. <laughs> and then um, the idea that you should be wearing helmets, every one of them say, you know, we suggest you wear a helmet. The, for the first time, I saw someone wearing one the other day. I was like, oh, oh my God. Um, but the argument is, well, you can have police that would be able to do that. No, we can't, because we don't have enough. If you want to regulate the safety issues with some of the Airbnb, that's, a, you know, we were talking about this on the panel, that's, that's ideal, but we, don't, we have to pay for that collectively. So unless we can find ways to get some of that money out of that system, 
I guess what I'm saying is it feels like a lot of the negative, the sharing aspect of the sharing economy is our shared cost of the negative externalities. But when you look at where the money itself goes, it feels very high up. And even when you talk about investors, this is another issue that comes to play with, with a lot of these new companies, because many of them are tech companies, is that investment to that is closed off. Most people don't have money in the market to begin with. And most of us that do have it in retirement plans like 401ks, IRAs, whatever. But you have situations like Bird and Lime who are privately owned. There, there is no public investment. So that investment comes from people that are insanely wealthy already. We don't, we don't invest in that. Or you have companies like Uber or Lyft that go public after the main, you know, they, the, the, the main time in which you would gain most of that money as an investor is already gone. So you're, yes, they're going up, but you're investing later in. So you're buying high and selling high instead of buying low and making money. So even the way in which those positive things are a little bit closed off. So I think that what we share becomes interesting to me, how those externalities are played and some of the messaging that they use to, to promote these. I'm sure we'll talk about messages of entrepreneurship as well, because I think to a certain extent that's true, and to another extent that's dishonest, depending on what, you know, different. These economies work differently. So the way in which entrepreneurship versus Uber versus Airbnb versus these other things might have different meanings, even though the messaging seems very similar. So those are kind of the areas that, that I focus on. I'm, I, I'll add more to it as we go. I, you guys are much more involved in it in the day-to-day -day than I am, so. Great, thank you. Um, Daniel, do you wanna circle back on some of these topics and also maybe talk a little bit about the economic opportunities that these platforms uh, might provide if there's relevance to the way that the individual who uses the platforms for income does or doesn't employ their own pop property uh, as part of a means of production? Yeah, uh, sure. So there are a couple of points that we, we just kind of touched on that went by that it's really important to dig into. Um, one, if you look, I found data on what the median, and I'm scrolling through my notes here trying to find it again, um, what the median like Airbnb host makes. And the median Airbnb host makes $924 a month, so about $11,000 a year. Um, I found data from 2017 for what Monroe County makes, and Mer Monroe County in 2017 Airbnb hosts made a total of 3.1 million. Around that time, there were about 280 Airbnb hosts, according to Airbnb. So that comes out to about $11,000 a year. It's right, right on the median. Um, that's not a lot of money. That's not, you know, that's, that's poverty wages, essentially. Uh, with Airbnb, that money is skewed. It's skewed older. It's skewed white. It's skewed towards property owners, which, you know, mostly older, white, and wealthier. Um, Airbnb is actually one of the better ones of all of these gig economy. I mean, for the average income for Lyft, from the, the same study that, that gave me those Airbnb numbers, the average income for Lyft is $377 a month or $4,500 a year. For Uber, it's $364 a month or you know $4,300 a year. Um, People aren't making money in these platforms. Not a significant amount, not enough to live off of, and they are putting in an enormous amount of work. The plat these platforms don't provide anything but the market space. That's all they provide. There's no insurance. They don't cover maintenance. They don't, you know, for Uber and Lyft, they don't cover gas, maintenance, insurance, your risk. They don't cover anything. For Airbnb, it's the same deal. They don't cover your maintenance. If, if an Airbnb guest destroys your house, you are on the hook for that. Same for cleaning. Um, so basically, these companies are, they, they, char they charge an enormous amount for the, the access to the market. Um, a lot of the time, Uber will take up to 50% of the fare and the fees they charge. Lyft, it's as much as 25%. It can spike to more. Um, Airbnb, they claim they charge, charge hosts a 3% fee but they charge guests a 13% fee. So their total takeaway from an a Airbnb fare is 16% potentially. If you do the host's only fee where they're not charging the guest portion of it, it's 14 to 20%. This is their own numbers. Um, so they're taking a huge cut of the money their users are making for access to this marketplace, and they're just vacuuming that right up into the upper class, basically, sucking it right out of the economy. Um, in terms of the impact of Airbnb on the housing market, 
Uh, I found an Economic Policy Institute study that was sort of a survey of a bunch of different studies that have been done in a bunch of different housing markets, and they pretty consistently found that Airbnb, because it takes housing units, as has been mentioned, out of the housing market, causes housing prices to go up. Um, you know, here the, in, in 2017, we had 280 hosts. I think you said now their numbers are, what, 600? So it's gone up uh, a lot. For comparison of what that means for our housing market in 2017, when we had a building boom that a lot of people complained vociferously about, we built about 500 new units. Just 500. So they are taking about, you know, it's two years, three years, I'm losing track of all time and space. Um, <laughs> you know, three years, they took 300 new units out of the market. We are at best adding 500 new units into the market. They're taking a significant chunk of our new housing or, you know, offsetting it by taking it out of the housing market. And housing prices are going up here. Um, new, the, the study that looked at New York found that Airbnb raised housing prices on average about $400 a month when they entered, a, entered New York, which compared to New York rents is maybe not that much, but when you're talking about trying to make ends meet and being a low-income person already strapped with New York prices, that makes the difference. Um, Yeah, I'm losing my thread, but that's. No, that's great. Um, so we are, we're running low on time, um, and I would like to give the audience an opportunity to do, to ask questions of the panelists. Uh, so we'll go ahead and open it up if that's okay. Does anyone have any questions? Um, we've covered a lot of ground on Airbnb, um, and I think that the positions are, are pretty clear that there are, there are some benefits uh, uh, to a certain segment, but that it doesn't spread around necessarily so much. But, but it's, the, the scooters are a, a sort of more interesting case in terms of who is receiving any benefit from it um, and what sort of work is created out of it. Um, and in... It, it, the it's not just that people can get around a little quicker and whether or not they're replacing a, uh, the right thing or the wrong thing is is up for debate but but in terms of the work that's created by the people who drive around and pick them up and charge them what kind of again going back to this question of the means of production who is owning these things and what things do they own when they use um, I, I'm curious both from the perspective of making transportation easier on tourists that may come to town and may be familiar with scooters uh, and the way in which students like the people in the room are using the scooters but also the way in which people can create some sort of opportunity out of a platform that isn't really designed to create a gig opportunity um, you know that that those sorts of questions I have about the scooter uh, thing and then just generally maybe particularly from Beth how the scooters maybe really uh, hijacked the opportunity for the for the Bloomington bike bike share plan to to take off. We could start with that point. That that'd be that I I'd really like to start with that question because I know it's it's near and dear to your heart. Okay. Um, okay. So to address um, how the scooters arriving impacted bike share and maybe some of the distinctions. I mean, I would say, number one, the most successful bike shares are subsidized. Um, I kind of don't like that word because also people think of it as bad. We subsidize driving a lot. So just to be clear, we could have invested in bike share and I think um, from the get-go, it was a deal that sounded too good to be true and then was. So I would say our bike share um, could have benefited from more investment, like capital investment, and could also benefit from a better system of bicycling in our community. So even we you needed more bikes in order for people to ride bikes more. Actually, this, one of the safest things for biking is how many people are biking, uh, and that makes a whole system safer. So, But then the company didn't want to invest in more bikes until 
we had more ridership, so it was just a challenge. But I would say the best bike share systems in the world are in places where, number one, it is a challenge to own a bike and store your bike. So New York City uh, does really great with their bike share. But if you live on a fourth floor apartment, it is not desirable to take your bike up there. And so I would say in Bloomington was, I think it could be very useful for visitors, but what was the thing we were trying to solve? Is owning a bike the reason people aren't biking or is it because, or bicycling, is it because they don't feel comfortable bicycling in our town? So if it's because they can't afford one, we have other avenues really to address that. But so that would be my first thing about why bike share didn't go great. And then this the scooters were just more prolific. I mean, they flood the market, and that is what they do. And we worked a lot with bike share, and then, of course, the MO for scooters is to show up and then be like, oh, yeah, we want to work with you. And they send an email before they come to town and are like, hey, we're going to bring scooters to your town. Like, we're so excited. Like, all of the language is like, we want to work with you. And it's like, that's what? I don't know. Um, but I do like scooters, and I think they could fit in to our transportation goals, but a lot of things would have to change for that to be true. That was a long answer, and I answered part of it, not the whole question. Well, and the, and the messaging question just sort of generally and how it reaches students, how it reaches tourists, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question, I think, for all of us. I want to answer one part of that, which is, is because we don't do education for our transportation system whatsoever. I mean, we teach people to drive and you get a license, but there's no other education that happens. So um, we also, uh, I don't even want to talk, we don't teach people how to drive in places where people walk and bike. We don't teach people how that they need to drive slowly or there are repercussions for breaking the law when you do drive. But like, we don't do that about other forms. So it could be even when you're becoming a driver, you have to learn all the rules of biking and scooting or whatever. But we don't do that. And maybe that'll be a huge shift, but I think it has to be part of our shift if we're becoming more multimodal communities. That's, that's my answer on it. Yeah, so, I mean, and the, 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 the other side of that too, and I, I think about the messaging, is the messaging that you get as a consumer of these mm -hmm. goods. Because marketplace theories assume a perfectly informed consumer, and we don't we don't know those things. When, when we so we, we do these things not knowing what those possible consequences are. So we might make different choices were we more informed about the things that we were doing and how those what those impacts were. But that that stuff is not readily discussed very often either. So. What was the turnaround time from the scooter's arrival to them being regulated? Do you remember? Oh, I feel like they arrived in October. Anybody? <laughs> Nobody knows. It was maybe like October 2018. And then was it by March or something? Pretty quick. We did a license, which is the way people are moving to license the vendor. And there's a... Uh, I'm afraid to say it in case the state here is like we can think about that with all the platforms, uh, but it is a license and six months or so. It, we could have done it ahead of time, but we didn't. Well, that's lightning fast for regulation turnaround time, right? I mean, normally it's a lot longer than that. I wonder if it was longer. I, it's possible it was six to nine months, but yeah, I think that's pretty quick for. So you give me a team of three senior engineers with an equivalent amount of experience to what I have and we could build a platform similar to Airbnb or Uber or Lyft in a matter of weeks. And with social media, it can gain traction overnight. Network effects. Network effects. <laughs> um, so I think we need to wrap up. We have some guests coming in. Um, and thank you for a wonderful weekend. Thank you, guys.